Having for many years been a fan of Cyril Frankel's um, TV and film work, uh, I first met him in London in the 90s to discuss the possibility of um, producing um, his memoirs or his, uh, you know, biography of some of his achievements. I didn't know half of what his achievements were at that point. But we had a meeting and I set out to um, try and find a publisher uh, who might be interested, including some of the people who specialised in film publications or books about television. And I, I really just drew a blank, um, so we decided to leave it there. Some years later, Henry Cobbold from Devworth came to Cyril with the same proposition, and um, uh, but with the um, with the idea simply of recording the uh, the memoirs and see where they went from there. Um, Cyril remembered the work I'd done, and he um, insisted that uh, Henry track me down, which he did. And um, the next time I met Cyril was in a studio in Nebworth. Um, where um, Henry had gone to get the biscuits, I think. So uh, we went into the studio and um, uh, we talked. Uh, Cyril was already quite frail by then um, and um, a shadow of his former self, I suppose, but he always remained lucid and he was always... Um, he, he actually spoke in complete paragraphs. He was a brilliant brilliant talker and um, we were able to get uh, this interview together and fortunately by then I was involved in publishing myself and I'm very proud to say that we eventually did get his autobiography published or his biography published as uh, Eye to Eye um, and this was in 2009-2010. Uh, so um, here's Un, un, um, unadulterated the interview that we got on that occasion. So essentially you started out making documentaries rather than working with actors, is that correct? Correct. Uh, so the first job I had was with Ealing Studios, but it was a film being made on the embankment. Um, what in the world was it called? Alec Guinness was in it. Hmm. Passport to Pimlico. I was a, a tenth assistant director or something like that. <clears throat> And when that folded, I was due to go on to a film at MGM as an assistant director. But uh, someone else got the job who rejected an opportunity he had to go to Crown Film Unit. He told me about that and it sounded to me exactly what I wanted to do. Well, so I made my way there and uh, put myself forward and was lucky enough to get uh, a kind of poorly paid job where the, the pay simply uh, covered my fares. But I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it was there that I made my first contact with uh, that giant of film personalities, John Grierson. I came to his attention because I made a film about Scottish fisheries called uh, Explorers of the Depths. And he liked it very much and kind of followed whatever I did and then put me in charge of a series called This Is Britain. And uh, then <clears throat> the Colonial Office 
because Crown existed on making films for the various ministries, um, <clears throat> the Colonial Office proposed a film about uh, soil erosion in Uganda. And uh, Grierson thought I should go over and have a look at it and possibly produce a treatment. So I took a seaplane to Uganda, landing on the lake near Kampala, uh, where I stayed overnight after meeting the governor who uh, was a member of the family, Waley Cohen, who had, uh, who owned Kenwood House, of which, uh, as I'd been at school in Highgate, I was very familiar with. And uh, next day a truck arrived to drive me to the district of Kigese, and I spent some time there uh, in touch with the uh, head of the local government, a man called Paolo Ingologosa. And the, certainly the title of our proposed book, Eye to Eye, was strongly felt on meeting him. And I think he felt it too, because he said, I feel I can trust my people with you. And uh, he introduced me to the son of a former uh, head of local government, uh, who became my personal assistant in every way, and he was a remarkable young man. Oh, well, we won't go into all of that at the moment, it's not relevant. But uh, he introduced me to all the local people that I, I felt very strongly I wanted to meet the pagans. I was, and because at this time the missionaries, both Protestant and Roman Catholic, were very active and converting people from their natural habits. And I wanted to meet the people who were still living as they had for generations. And uh, Sepp, as he was called, this younger lad, would take me around to meet people and to travel. And I went to meet families who'd never seen a white man before. And uh, I remember one particular occasion where we had to walk miles to get to this family and we got there and there were the semicircle of mud huts because he, every wife a man had had her own hut and a wife cost certainly at least two cows and five goats was quite a lot of wealth and uh, anyhow we sat there and they were cooking on wood fires and then they came to me and said did I bring some food with me which I hadn't and they said oh would you like something to eat and I said well yes and they said, do you mean you would eat our food? And I said, why not? And this 
uh, created quite a lot of amazement among them. But they did bring me some uh, roasted corn and some vegetables and some fruit. And then they started singing and dancing. And I felt I had to join in. So I did, to their amazement and laughter. And then, when that subsided, some elders came and said, would I come and talk with them? And so I went up a hill and we sat in a circle and we were each given a gourd of whatever it was their local drink was. And we sat in a semicircle or circle on top of the hill in the middle of Uganda, shaded by the mountains, Ruinzori Mountains. They were called Mountains of the Moon. And uh, sipped away at these goods. And uh, it was quite, I don't, I won't say it was powerful stuff, but it's been rare that I've sat in a group of people and felt such communion with them. And it was just extraordinary. Do you feel there's a, there's a kind of, through your life, there's been a sort of spiritual quest, hasn't there? You've been very involved in the spiritual side. Did that give you a particular affinity with these people, that sort of um, natural religion? Yes. Yes. It was a point of where you were in communication. And when people were, have asked me, how did I manage to get these? acting performances out of these so-called primitive people, pagans, and the pygmies whom I adored. Um, it simply was intuition and I don't know what the visual word is for um, that kind of exchange of communication. Yeah, like a natural affinity on a, a level beyond yeah. language, beyond uh, yes. culture. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, well, that was the start of uh, my time in Uganda. The big thing certainly was communication with the Batwa, the pygmies. And I mentioned it before, and I may, will mention it many times, John Grierson, he kept in communication with me by extent of his mind even though I was thousands of miles away. Of course, he also sent me telegrams, comments on rushes, and suggestions for the future. And uh, that was, again, this kind of spiritual communication. I know we have the word telepathy for words, but I'm talking of images. How did the uh, mechanics of that work in terms of, uh, I mean, if you, you shot some film, did that, was that sense sealed back to England? But, yes. So essentially then you, there was no way you could actually see what you shot. I didn't know. And uh, I was mentioning before to Henry that when I came back, Grierson met me at the airport with the editor 
and we chatted on, on the car drive back. And Griff said, you really don't know what you've done, do you? And I said, well, does it all join together? Does it add up? And he was very enthusiastic about it. He said, you'll see tomorrow. And that I regard, above all, as my best work. I'm not saying it is. Said I regard. Um, well, it certainly must. I mean, in, in in your career and in the history of the cinema, it must be. It's a milestone. It's something that. I well, I hope to... it will be recognised as such mm. eventually. But the problem was that it was finally made for an organization called Group 3. And the uh, head of that was really Michael Balkan of Ealing Studios. And Michael Balkan, with Harry Watt, had been making films in Kenya, not of an African nature, but for commercial reasons. And when Grierson produced an all-black film in a kind of way, a feature documentary, Michael Balkan felt it was totally uncommercial. And this led, particularly as his company which was also distributing Group C films, went into uh, liquidation. And the uh, Man of Africa virtually disappeared. I mean, I'm not speaking against Michael Balkan, who was extremely good to me as well. But uh, I'm speaking really that Griff In a way, is not fully is not fully recognised for mm. what he did mm. round the world. Mm. Canadian Film Unit, India, Australia, and Crown and the Post Office films. And when he was making a series called, I think, This Wonderful Life, I think it was called. Scottish television. I mean, one of his last appearances on that program, he said, if I am to be remembered, I would wish it to be remembered for Man of Africa. Oh, that's so wonderful. That makes, and uh, I have always therefore felt a compulsion to get it recognised for what it is. I don't think there is another all-black film. Yeah. When was the... Because uh, it was lost for years, wasn't it? When was it rediscovered and how did that come about? Um, when I was in the army in Germany, I joined forces with... I was head of... Was I called on date or Army Welfare Services of five divisions? And I was at the headquarters of five divisions. And also, there was a, another chap who was in charge of education called Brian Taylor. And we, as it were, clicked. We both liked music, we both liked different things, and so put on a series of concerts with the Brunswick Symphony Orchestra, and Brian, who previously had been in Berlin, introduced me to the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra and the Romanian conductor, C. 
scared you, Telly Badaka. And so we invited the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra to come and play for us in Brunswick. And uh, through obvious channels, I got some very fine personalities through INSA. And so we had a whole period of creating entertainments of a pretty uh, high nature. And uh, uh, this led to a close friendship between myself and Brian Taylor, which exists to this day. And uh, we have made films together and keep in constant touch. What was your question now? Was he involved in the rediscovery of Man of Africa? Or... Ah, yes. Yes. Well, he knew my feelings about Man of Africa. And I don't know exactly how it came about, but he discovered there was a copy in... Luton or somewhere like that. Unexpected, he found it in a list. And we managed to acquire the copy and made a fresh one. And it was shown by, at the Film Institute. Grierson also had taken it to the Venice Festival and to the Berlin Film Festival. And it has been shown at many film festivals. But uh, It hasn't yet come out on DVD, which I think it should be. And I'm hoping that in conjunction with our book, that it may be shown at the Film Institute again. And I think it might have its proper recognition. Yes very much the sense that it was before its time, isn't it? Which I think was what Balkan was saying to some extent. It was, it would be far better recognised now than perhaps when it was made. Oh, I'm sure. Is that angle good for you, Tom? It's okay. not too high. <coughs> um, I'm, I just think we're moving it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to shift it down a little bit? Yeah, because yeah, I think... Yeah. I want to hop forward a few years, if they're all possible, because I want to cover this, um, the area with the TV series. Yes. Uh, how did you first um, get together with Monty Berman? Um, <clears throat> I was working at Associated British because I'd made a film, one of my favourites, It's Great to be Young. I don't know if you ever saw that. A rather joyous film. 
and I was based there, and I, I originally just had the agreement for the one film, but they then, with the success of It's Great to Be Young, they extended it to a three-year contract or something to make further films for them. So I was based in the studios. Similarly, in the studios, Bob Baker and Monty Berman had their office planning television series. And we would regularly meet in the uh, for lunch in the canteen restaurant. And they started to make a series called Gideon's Way. And they invited me to make one, which became the first one to go out. And then they invited me to continue. I think I made about five. Very enjoyable, very good scripts. And... Uh, that was John Gregson? Who starred John Gregson. And it's time it was with it is it was re-shown because the quality was very good. My own personal attitude was many films made for television were of inferior quality. And I wanted to bring the quality of cinema to television. And somehow or other, that worked. And the films or the series has, has been very successful. At uh, that point, Monty and um, Robert S. Baker were still working together. They were they? still working together. And um, Bob Baker went on Bob to do the Baker, saint. Bob yeah. Baker went on to do the saint. I didn't. I was offered the saint, but I was not terribly interested because I didn't feel I could aid. Roger Moore, who was so self-sufficient in his acting that I thought, well, I'm just going to be sitting there while he walks through, and so I didn't. But anyhow, I had an opportunity through my agent to meet Joan Fontaine. And Joan Fontaine had come to England with her script and uh, she needed it as a director and my agent had put me forward because he was also representing her and a man called Dennis Van Tall and uh, Joan and I met at a Hotel off Bond Street, and uh, eye to eye, it worked. She was happy to have me direct her. And uh, this is the witches. This is the witches, and uh, we made that for Hammer. And while we were in the middle of shooting, Bob Baker and uh, Dennis Spooner, his writer, came to see me and said they were going to make two television series and would I be interested in 
setting the style of them, as it were. Mm. One was um, uh, the champions, the theme of which immediately appealed to me, and the other was a kind of follow-up of an American series called Topper, which I had seen in the cinema, called, which became called simply Randall and Hopkirk. And so, with that invitation, when I became unemployed, I was happy to go and look again to Elsie's studios and uh, start making, hopping from one series to another. And uh, that began an association with Monty Berman, which uh, carried on with Department S, Jason King and several others, which of course were all made for that great personality, Lord Great, and who had interest, interest in making programs suitable for American television. And so on it went. Mm -hmm. Because the Champions, which is certainly one of my favorites, I was involved right from the beginning in the casting of it. And uh, did Monty share your um, interest in kind of spiritual and... No, not, no, no I wouldn't say he did. No, I just wondered because he's supported those, I mean, both those series in a sense were, had those elements in them. Yes. I just wondered, yeah. No, I, no. Monty and I were, became very good associates. Yeah. Right for the rest of his life. And uh, we, he lived near where I lived, and so we would travel together to the studio in the morning and back, and it was during those journeys that we would always discuss the next episode and casting and all these things. Very nice period. Mm. There's, a, there's a sense that comes across that under Lou Grade, um, things were possible. There wasn't that, like you have now, the kind of accountants running everything. Lou was always ready to, to try something, to support something, wasn't he? Oh, yes. He was very open, and if I had some queries, or he had some queries on the series I was associated with, um, he would be in his office, uh, near Marble Arch uh, from 7.30 in the morning. Mm. I remember on particularly on one occasion uh, I went to see him and I got into the lift to go up to his office and when the doors opened there he was lighting his first cigar and he's and uh, we went into his office, he said, well, I don't have very long, sir, because I'm up to my eyes in Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a series he was yeah. also making at the time. But I found him delightful. And we, in fact, he was, I was the only director. He gave a fairly small, percentage profit to for my old age he said well I'm now in my old <laughs> age oh. and occasionally I do get a, a 
a, a pittance of a check. It's a nice thought. It is. And what about the other people you worked with on those series then? But the other, well, there were other directors, Roy Ward Baker? Yeah. Did you, um, I mean, you were you were creative consultant on the show, so I guess you kind of created the style. I set the style and uh, how much they followed it, I can't say. I'm still um, referred to in relation to three theories um, as the creative consultant. Um, no, it was a happy, busy period for me mm -hmm. because as I finished one episode, I would have to cross over to another stage to start an episode on another, on a different series. Mm. Yeah, it was very engaging. Mm. And uh, a lot of, um, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming that the um, the second unit stuff was presumably done beforehand, was it, all the location stuff? And then no. You, no. No, it would be going on much the same much time. The same time. So would you use doubles for these some of these scenes abroad? It would depend. We occasionally went abroad ourselves. And uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but that doesn't matter. There was a later series where I worked had a unit, I think, in Amsterdam. But I didn't have a script. And Dennis Spooner, with whom I collaborated very closely, on the telephone said, Oh, Cyril, just shoot some action scenes and we'll write scripts around them. Right. <laughs> And so I, I did that, and that worked out. I have to say, working with Dennis Spooner was very joyful and practical and progressive. Mm -hmm. Yes, he created a lot of stuff, didn't he? Oh, yes. And it had a... Um, had a character to it, mm. you could tell that he uh, uh, And you, you had a, a, a close relationship with him on the development of those shows, I guess. Yes, I, and unfortunately we can't ask him to confirm that. No. And you, um, another classic that people remember was Time Slip with uh, Jerry Anderson. You did with uh, Patrick Allen on the UFO series? Yes. That was a singular piece of work, wasn't it? Well, I haven't seen it for years. There was a lot of um, space-time continuum stuff going on there. You had yes. cameras moving round, uh, pieces of dust in the air. and uh, Yes. It seems quite an epic for a... TV show from that time, and, and I think quite original to yes. use those kind of effects. Yes. Did you conceive those? Did you do that with um, with the, uh, the writer, or how did that sort no, of No, it just happened in the actual shooting. Because we, we're, we're quite familiar these days with these kind of computer-generated things where the camera can move around a special effect. But to do it then must have been a much more mechanically difficult business, I would have thought. Well, it required imagination and... Um,
practical involvement with the cameraman. Mm. I remember on one of those episodes with Nairi Dawn Porter, I think her name was, I had a slow motion Bobby Patrick Allen and her having to move in slow motion. Well, normally with slow motion, you had a special camera and that did the work for you. I didn't have such a special camera available, so I persuaded them to move oh, right. in a slow motion way. And when we had rushes, Jerry Anderson complimented me on the slow motion. And I said, well, it wasn't, it was... And he was quite amazed. But I preferred working with Monty Berman, mm -hmm. I have to say, because Monty had been a film man for yeah, many I'm years sorry, yes. in the army, he and Bob Baker met in the army film unit, and uh, the other person I met who is terribly important to the director I mentioned before is the cameraman. And when I did my first television series, Gideon's Way, I met up with a cameraman called Denny Densham. He and his brother, twin brother, were both cameramen. But Denny Densham and I simply had exactly the same sense of movement. Just intuitively the same. And we worked a lot together. And that working with the cameraman is so important for a director. Later I worked with Freddie Francis, another fine cameraman, and one other names escape one again. Freddie went on to direct, didn't he? Freddie went on to direct at Hammer. Now, what's the name of this great cameraman, Oscar-winning cameraman? Um, Lawrence of Arabia, I think. Mm. He escapes me yeah, now. Blank as well. It's a wonderful experience again. <laughs> I can normally call some of these up. I can't. I know. <laughs> in a blank as well. Yeah. Well, you would know it well. Yeah. And I think the um, the last TV of that kind you. Oh, hang on, because then there was the Protectors after that. You did, the Protectors was with another... Was that Group 3 again, was it? I remember the was Robert, Robert Vaughan. Oh, yes. Um, I enjoyed working with him. Hmm. Can't remember at the moment much about it. No, I think it was a slightly bigger budget affair. It was... Uh, hmm was a, a commercial one. But going back to Monty Berman, one of the things that Monty did really was to use film people, didn't he? I mean, all oh, yes. the sense, everything was done, as you said before, as, as a film would have been made with yes. scenic artists, with um, oh, yes. um, Van Montague, Pedro Van Montague. Mm. Um, and there were people with film experience that were used on those series. Oh, yes. And then finally, there was the tennis court thing with Hammer. Oh, yes. 
That was the last there of that period. I must look at that again because I can't, haven't seen it since. No, nor have I. I saw it when it came out, but not since. And so, parallel with this, then came the Monitor films. You started now doing, or parallel with, or subsequent to this, you began making films for BBC. For the BBC, yeah. How did that actually come to pass? It came to pass because over many years, I had admired the work of Dame Lucy Reeve of Potter. And we developed a very subtle friendship. And I would see her every week. I began to collect some of her work. And uh, she didn't like being photographed, but I felt we should make a film somehow for um, history. Mm -hmm. And through Lucy Ree, I had met Sir Robert and Lady Lisa Sainsbury, who also were great admirers of hers. And uh, I said to an editor friend of not so much a friend of mine, but a friend of my assistant in continuity, Anne Dealey. She had a friend who was an editor. And I said to him, I really want to make a film about Lucy Ree, and it's coming up to her 80th birthday. And uh, the Sainsbury's are giving her a Mission at the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich. And I do feel one should make a film about her. And he said, well, BBC. So I thought about it. And I picked up the telephone, got through to the BBC, and said, can I speak to whoever's in charge of the art department, and I got through to someone and I said, I would like to make a film about this. And he said, yes, so would we. <laughs> and we've, we've wanted to for some time, but she won't be filmed. So I said, well, I'm a good friend of hers. If I can persuade her, he said, come back to me, we'll make it. And so I went to see Lucy in the Muse near Marble Arch, where she had her studio. And I said, I rang the bell and she came. She said, you'll never guess who was here. And she mentioned another director wanting to make a film about me. And I said, you must be mad. And I said, well, actually, I've been to the BBC, and she said, Cyril, you know I hate being filmed. No. And so I was rather depressed, but some friends of hers, including the, the wife of Bernard Leach, the great potter, I met her in the Muse when I was going to visit Lucy a little later, and she said, I think she's changing her mind. And she said, you go and ask her. And sure enough, she said, I think we should make this film. 
So I rushed to the BBC and said, yes, you see me on and so we made it. And it is for when I had to think of who could do the commentary and persuaded David Attenborough. And the film is only short, you know, 15 minutes, I think is in most galleries, copies are in most galleries around the world. And uh, that started me off. And you went on, uh, among the things you did then was the the, the Nutcracker, wasn't it? It's, uh, the you, Nutcracker uh, Pas de Deux, yes. And that was cut to the score, is that? Or well, cut to the choreography? Yes. And he combined the choreo choreographic movement with his, with the camera movement. So you essentially choreographed the camera as well as the dancers. Yeah, and was yeah. that done with a single camera or with a, a multiple? Yes, single I think camera. It was a single camera. I would have liked three, mm. but it came down to the one. And is that uh, available now? Is it, can it be seen somewhere? The Film Institute have a copy. Oh, have okay, I'm going to rest now, Cheryl, because we've got a lot more to do today. Yes. That's great. It's wonderful. Thank well, you for I that. Hope, I hope it's of some I value hope, I hope to we'll you. live long enough to see the sandwiches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Henry. Ha, ha, ha.